Hi everyone, welcome back to Dilma School of Tea's Brew Academy. It's been over 2021 that we led the session. Our baby, now we are now back broadcasting live and going on our clubs and school tea alumni pages to talk about what makes a great tea. So why we are starting out new series for 2023 with what makes a great tea is that he is so incredibly imbued with the blessings of nature. Kerala is ultimately the sense of place. You use it in wine terminology to indicate some characteristics that deliver taste, certain flavors, certain aromas. But in tea, it happens because in tea, the terroir is about the fingerprint of nature, which indelibly defines the taste, the characteristics, and so on. But there's a few more, there's a few things that we need to do to make sure that we harness and experience. Great tea is so very important today because we have a new generation of tea drinker that's coming to tea. We have Gen Z and the millennials looking to tea like never before. Why? Healthy, naturally good for you, infused with nothing additive, no additives, nothing artificial, and so all natural. And today, this is the quintessential adaptogen. It is the quintessential immune booster. Tea is the quintessential nature-based, plant-based beverage. So let's have a look at what we have for you today. So switching to the presentation, guys, uh, we're going to look first at what we call the influence of heaven, earth, and father taker on tea. So it's it's about power. I know in wine changed quite often, but in tea, what exactly is it? We're going to be tasting a few teas in a minute, but let me first give you a little bit of an introduction. In tea, it is the wind that crafts brightness. It is sunshine that delivers the polyphenols that produce certain characteristics in tea. It is the cool, light air in Nuria, the afternoon showers, the bright mornings that craft the fruit, the softness, the bright, the, the, the almost luminous characteristics of a fine Nuria Peco. So nature and the fingerprint of indelibly in every single tea because you can trace every characteristic back to some element of nature. So let's have a look. We have rainfall. Rainfall isn't a good thing because what rainfall does is it affects the metabolic process. It delivers much more water to the leaf because it is the leaf, it is the juices, the sap in the leaf that produces the flavor, the texture, and so on, influencing the goodness, the polyphenols, all of which produce the texture, the, the intensity, the mouthfeel, the flavor, and the aromas in tea. So rainfall, necessary, but in moderation. Next, you have sunshine. Sunshine is fantastic, because in tea, you have a plethora of different volatile compounds, linalool, geraniol, 400 of them. Now, what nature does is nature is the conductor of this symphony of flavor. It means that in the Himalayas or the foothills of the Himalayas, nature induces through soil, through the climate, through the temperatures and through the wind conditions, induces in camellia senses that same plant, it induces that characteristic, the muscatel note that is characteristic of Darjeeling. Yet the same plant at approximately similar elevation in Norelia yields something quite different, more herbal, a little bit more of lychee, longan, if you know those fruits. The same plant in a different place producing something different. And that's the fingerprint of nature. Because when you take the same plant down to by the port city of Gaul, in that beautiful city there, you have the tea plantations, tea estates down by Elpitia, um, 
in the in inner parts of Gaul, you have tea plantations that are fanned by the winds of the Indian Ocean. You have much, Andes, you have much shorter diurnal range. And there, nature produces in the same plant, Camellia sinensis, an uh, almost identical process. The traditional orthodox manufacturing method produces tea that is extraordinarily different. It's different, it has a different aroma, and it has a different taste profile. So, what's clear is that it is nature delivers all of this, and it is sunshine, it is the rainfall, it's the wind, it's all of this. We're going to go into that a lot more in the next episode, but for now, talking about what makes great tea. So, it is all of these characteristics, but then to produce a great tea, because today we're talking about how we can offer a really good tea to our guests or to ourselves, freshness is important, because it is freshness that protects and preserves each of these characteristics, that preserves the fingerprint of nature for the tea when you brew, reversing what we have done in the process, reversing that, that final step where we extract all the moisture and arrest all the biochemical, the natural biochemical processes in tea to make the tea ready for you to brew. And so freshness is very important. Now, when I talk of freshness, in terms of tea, tea can be fresh for even up to three years. How? If it's picked, but garden fresh at source, and if it's put storage thereafter. A little more in a minute, but first let's have a look at tea manufacturing. What is it about manufacturing that produces this extraordinary? We're going to taste variety in a minute, but I have to give you the preamble. So the preamble is this, tea isn't picked. And in this, there is a, a certain science and a reason is art as well. And picking is critically important to the whole process of tea and it's important for a great tea. Why? Because it's only the human eye and the method of hand picking that can discern the two leaves and bud or the youngest, most tender leaves and bud that contribute most to flavor. Flavor is also connected to the polyphenols in tea, to the natural antioxidants, the family of antioxidants that also produce the flavor, the mouthfeel, the texture, the intensity, the brightness. And so freshness is important for flavor and the natural antioxidant goodness. So our process begins with the hand picking, which is so very important. It continues through the withering, which essentially we, we bring the moisture levels down. And then it continues through rolling as the physicians of ancient China did. And it progresses through to the final step of fermentation, eventually uh, firing. Firing is when the tea maker says, look, this tea is ready. And now we bring the moisture level down and stop all the natural processes that are happening in the leaf. But essentially, what is it? Why do we talk about tea? as a natural luxury, simply because all of these natural processes focus on the sap, the cell sap, the juices within the leaves, because it is that juice conditioned by weeks of different climatic influences of the wind, the rain, and all of the things we talked a moment ago, it is that which delivers the mouthfeel, the flavor, the aroma, the appearance, and all of those characteristics of tea. And so what does that mean? It means that, as you see at the bottom of the slide, it means that in the industrial method called the CTC, cut, twist, and curl, you have a, a very simple uh, attempt at dominate tea, which is industrial, invented in the 1950s, which produces homogeneous and very uniform tea, granules, uh, quite, similar to, quite similar to what you see here. But it also means that in the traditional orthodox manufacturing method, which we value and honor as tea makers who love tea, you can produce 
a multitude of different teas, of different leaf sizes, of different tastes, flavors, aromas. And that multitude is important. You can see at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see the, a few, a very small representation. We have there teas from the Aurelia, teas from the Dimula Valley. You have a, an oolong, you have a white tea, you have a tea from Ratnapura. You have a selection of teas, and we've shown you the liquors and the uh, leaf infusion. May not be clear to see, but we'll have a closer look in a minute so that you understand the value of the traditional orthodox method. Orthodox method respects the rhythm of nature, respects the climatic influences, the terroir and the sense of place. So the traditional orthodox method is what we value and it's what gives such incredible variety and beauty to tea. Why is that variety and beauty important in great tea? It's because it's that variety that makes tea relevant to our lives because tea has incredible resonance with food, bringing out the textures, the flavors of food, and also helping the digestion process, helping with gut health, helping the body to synthesize the sugars in order to protect the body from diabetes and other things. But gut health is also important, particularly after a meal, because when you sip a cup of tea after your meal, and aid the body in digesting and synthesizing sugars, you're also enhancing your body's ability to sleep well. Gut health is critically important for sleep, but we'll talk about that in a future issue concerning tea and health. So where I was, was at the point of kindness. Ultimately, everything done with kindness to people and to nature is destined for great things. And that's also an important component in a cup of tea because the lives of millions are intertwined in every cup of tea. And that means a fair and ethical price. But also remember that as tea growers, we're at the front line of climate change. What we do impacts the resilience that farmers have, impacts uh, carbon sequestration and impacts the livelihoods of thousands. Adopting new methods like agroforestry and so many other things also contribute to a great cup of tea. But we're going to talk about that later because we're going to move on to looking the final bit of theory before I get on to, uh, before I get on to tasting uh, is this. So what makes the elements of a great tea? Firstly, a great tea with lots of flavor and, and taste it's higher in polyphenols. Polyphenols are because they're antioxidants, the antioxidants which are connected to taste, but also dictate the natural goodness in tea. Higher polyphenol content in hand-picked leaves because the young tender leaves, the first leaf, for example, having the highest antioxidant level after the bud. The bud is the number one, then the first leaf, the second leaf, and then on to the older, more mature leaves, which have a bit of bitterness, not so great, but also not so good for human health. And then we have the next indicator of greatness is the appearance of the tea and its infused leaf. So we have here a beautiful tea from Craighead Estate. We have a tip. We have a beautiful appearance because on the eye, it's very much the precursor to taste, to appreciation, to sensory perception. But then in that same tea, you have the infusion of the leaf. To a tea taster, this infusion gives with 70% accuracy an idea of what this tea is going to be. Is it going to be floral? Is it going to be citrusy? Will it be herbal? Will it be chocolatey? Will it be bitter? Will it be bright? Will it be muddy? Is it a good tea? Has it got any manufacturing defects? All of that from the appearance. And so elements of a great tea. Clarity. Clarity is important because sometimes you find teas that might be quite muddy, might uh, be quite uh, opaque. Now that's not good for our sensory perception. When you see something that's bright and beautiful, it's like seeing a beautifully laid out table. 
it is inviting, it is appetizing, it is a precondition to good food. You know, sometimes you see food, you might see, I hope you never have, but uh, I have unfortunately an omelette that's almost blue with poor storage, not very appetizing. So what you see on the eye is a precursor. And if what you see isn't appetizing, what you taste is diminished. So clarity is important. Yet there's so much more in clarity. See the clarity in this Ranwatta at 6,000 feet elevation. This tea has beautiful clarity. So does the Dimbulla. So does our Yatavatta, our uh, Madhavatta. And finally, so does our Yatavatta. Very different levels of clarity, but all good teas. And then there is, of course, the color, the strength. And then there is the aroma. Now, aroma is defined by the polyphenols, by the theophylines, by all the combination of antioxidants and so many other elements, the amino acids, the proteins, a little bit of the caffeine in tea. It is that which dictates the flavor. Now, when you talk of flavor, I mentioned earlier 400 volatile compounds in tea. And that symphony means in Norelia, you have nature which is with its conducting, while conducting the orchestra, is requesting the first violin to play up. And the first violin, in this case, equivalent to linalool, geraniol, the, the, the lighter, more aromatic compounds in the flavor profile. Light, bright, a beautiful norality. And on the where tea is concerned, what you see on the eye corresponds with what you see, what you experience on the nose. Brightness, it's a little herbal, little fruity, touch of sweetness in the edge. And yet here's another brilliant tea. It's also a great tea. It has clarity, it has intensity. It's much darker, it's very different. From Nilagama Estate, it has intensity. It's almost almost bitter in its chocolatiness. Will be fabulous with certain types of food. Completely different to our Ranwatta here. So, aroma, flavor, texture, color, the appearance of the leaf, a very dark infusion. This is the infused leaf against a light, almost olive green, coppery infusion for Ranwatta. Two fabulous teas, both great teas, but just very different in what they represent. So let's move on. So in order to preserve this, we're about to taste. In order to preserve all of this, you need to store your tea well. Why? Because the volatile elements in tea, they have a, first of all, they have a very, very low threshold, and they're very easily lost. When you brew a fine tea, the aroma that you get will often be the aroma of the floral or the light bright elements in your tea leaving. So my father always talks about placing a lid on the cup of tea while you brew it. And anyone who has walked past a tea factory while it's in operation, will recall that incredible aroma, which is of the volatile elements in tea in the process of manufacture, because lots of these volatiles, they develop in the process of manufacture. And then how you extract it. So you've got your fresh tea. It's fresh to the point of being packed at source. So the flavor, the fragrance, the goodness is sealed in. You've stored it well. My father also talks about storing a refrigerator. Why? That's because to keep the temperature down, to be able to minimize bacterial activity. But then you've got to make sure you brew it right. So tea requires water, but it requires good water. Calcium, particularly in tea, in, in water, can inhibit flavor, fresh that the goodness, it can make it quite, quite unappealing, muddy, quite uh, unpleasant in aroma. So mineral content needs to be controlled. Typically, a tea should be brewed in water of around six, six and a half degrees, uh, six, uh, six and a half uh, pH. 
but also it should have total dissolved solids of less than 100. Ideally, even less would be better. You do need some and you need to boil. You know, you have all those fancy kettles that say 60 degrees, 80 degrees, fabulous, but you need to boil the water. But then in the case of light, bright teas like this one, you need to allow the water to cool. And that's really as simple as decanting the water once from a clean, dry porcelain vessel from the kettle into that, decant it once, you lose five degrees, twice, lose 10 degrees. And this tea would be optimum brewed at around 80 to 85 degrees. A green tea between 75 and 80 degrees. So three, four times. You don't need a thermometer for all this. And the reason is that because the flavor, particularly the lighter aromatic elements in tea are volatile, you need to make sure that you don't burn them off. You don't lose them with water that is too hot. So if you pour boiling hot water directly onto a light, bright tea that is bursting with goodness and flavor and aromatics, you would effectively be scalding it and completely losing it because of the temperature that you're applying to that tea. So freshness, the right amount of tea, the right amount of water, and believe it or not, and this is a topic for a future session of the Brew Academy, believe it or not, the shape of the vessel, the drinking vessel also has an influence. Imagine taking this tea, drinking it out of a tin cup. I think you get what I mean. So it's not only the shape that influences the aroma, but it's also the shape that influences how the tea impacts the tongue. So you have the five senses, the sweet, the sour, the bitter, the, the uh, umami, and so on. But also you have how where the tea comes in. So if you have a thick mug, sometimes you lose some of the sweetness. But around the tongue, you have most of your sensory receptors at the back, the bitterness, which is there to prevent you from ingesting anything that's toxic and, and, and uh, unpleasant. So now we come to we come to a point where we're going to be tasting. So we've got a few teas, okay? And I'm going to talk to you about a few great tea. So the first tea is our Ceylon Silver Tips. It's a beautiful tea and it's beautiful not only because of the art in it, but also because of the fact that Ceylon Silver Tips is a pure white tea. It's just the bud. The bud of the tea leaf is where natural goodness is most concentrated and it is, it's an acquired taste, mind you. So any of our friends watching from the Middle East, if you like strong tea, people watching from Sri Lanka, like strong tea, particularly tea with milk, this is not the tea for you. But we present it in a champagne flute because it is in essence, the champagne of tea. Each tea picker who would normally pick 18 to 25, sometimes more kilograms of tea would be able to manage maybe 200 to 250 grams of Ceylon silver tips because it's an extremely delicate process. When you pick the bud, you need to make sure that you don't crush the bud and you don't allow the, the fermentation to begin. That would bring bitterness. So here, light on the eye. Beautiful floral notes. Got lychee. You've got sweetness. You've got uh, uh, almost a, an orchid, almost a frangipani like uh, floral characteristic, light, beautifully delicate, also on the nose, fabulous with certain types of food, a little bit of maybe a soft lime pie, something like this, but also an extremely rare uh, indulgence. And then we have a green tea. So in this case, we're using our organic leafy green tea. So green tea, also a really great tea, herbal, beautiful notes of straw. It's got freshly cut grass. It's, it's a great tea, but in a very different way to our white tea. So here you have a fabulous combination with salads, with fish, with, with so many different uh, types of food. So it interacts with our lifestyles in a very different way. Magnificent on its own. And then we come a little further down to 
Opath Estate. Here we've got a first leaf oolong. So an oolong has a mild fermentation, a very light fermentation. It is in between a green tea and a black tea because it is fermentation that decides on the difference. And it is fermentation that transforms the catechins into theorobegins to deliver the intensity and the, the strength in a black tea and the mild intensity in an oolong. Fabulous again, peachy, a little bit more body, yet gentle and yet quite mild. And then we come to a souchon, in this case, a Ceylon souchon. What is a Ceylon souchon? It's a tea that on Rilene Estate, we smoke using cinnamon wood, Ceylon tea, for which, which is synonymous with Sri Lanka, but also Ceylon cinnamon, for which we were invaded in 1505 by the Portuguese. So what the cinnamon does, it burns at a very different temperature to the pine wood that is usually used for Lapsang Souchong. And it also imparts the volatile, the elements, the oils, the eugenol, the cinnamaldehyde, which softens and adds a beautiful fragrance to this tea. Some of you who are new to the School of Tea to Brew Academy are probably going to wonder why I'm slurping. Quick lesson on the side. As tea tasters, what my colleagues do around me is taste, but they slurp when tasting. So this gets a noisy place as we taste our 10,000 teas each week. And so the reason for that is you've got your sweet, sour, salt, bitter umami around your tongue, but also in your brain, you have the olfactory bulb. And to be able to give the olfactory bulb the possibility of analyzing and giving definition to what you taste, you need to be able to slurp. And that's how we do it. Try it at home. And why it's useful, maybe not when you're in a beautiful restaurant, why it's useful is that it helps you to decipher what nature has done in this tea. So in this tea, it's intense. It's got gut, it's got strength, it's got boldness. And I know that this tea would work beautifully on a morning when I need energy, strength, enlivening. It will work beautifully after lunch if I were to have a steak or a grilled chicken by tasting. So of course, we can elegantly sip, but the definition, the resolution and texture that you get when slurping is something quite different. So that brings us, yes, to this tea. Now here we have an English breakfast. What is an English breakfast? A breakfast tea is a tea that gives energy and strength. Back in the day, in the late 1800s, when the Scottish and English tea planters woke up in the morning, in Norelia, Hatton and so on around Sri Lanka, it was cold because tea manufacturing starts very early in the morning. So to ward off the cold, they wanted a brew that was strong and bright. And Hence, breakfast, which started out as Scottish breakfast, evolved into English breakfast, and today is Ceylon breakfast, English or Scottish breakfast. But a breakfast tea needs to be bold. It needs to be bright because it has to have that energy and that uh, uh, intensity, the brightness that uh, is, is great for a morning. So if you see a light English breakfast, that's not a breakfast tea. This is based on the original recipe for breakfast tea. So then we have infusions. We have black teas. Now people talk about black teas as being one type of tea, but these are four black teas. I know this looks a little like an oolong, but it's a black tea. And so you have a light bright grown at a very high level, 6,000 feet above sea level. You have a, a, a slightly more structured, uh, woody bright tea that is uh, 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 grown at around 4,000 feet. You have another at around 2,000 feet, getting malty, a little bit more uh, uh, earthy. And here you have bitterness in the Yatawatta. It is fantastic. It has notes of chocolate and actually brilliant with bitter chocolate as well, with, with dark chocolate. And uh, so now we've been through our white tea. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I've moved the slides, but we've come uh, all the way to uh, 
uh, we've come all the way to a, a black tea. And so the point I want to share is what makes a great tea. It's a tea that's made with love. It's a tea that's made in the traditional orthodox style. It's a tea that is grown, made in the traditional artisanal way, orthodox, and packed at source because freshness is absolutely critical. It is a non-negotiable when it comes to flavor, aroma, and all of those things that make greatness in tea. But what makes a tea great is also the natural goodness. And there again, freshness, proper storage is non-negotiable. The antioxidants in tea are pretty amazing. And in a future session, we'll go into it a little, in a little more depth. We'll also invite Professor Thissa Amarakon, who will help us talk to us a little bit about how tea enhances the body's immunity, how tea um, addresses or protects the body from dementia, protects the body from heart disease, from stroke, from stress, from pollution, so many other things. And it's, it's really quite extraordinary and a very important part of what makes a tea great. And then we come finally to the different types of tea, black tea, green tea. There is no one taste profile. So whether it is uh, one of four teas, now behind this lies almost 10,000 different teas. We taste 10,000 here. And each of these could be a black tea. And most of the 10,000 are black teas, but they're all very different. And so that brings us to the end. If there are any questions, um, guys, can people share questions? Yes, if there are any questions, send them through in the chat and we'll be happy to answer. But in the meantime, what we have coming up is luxury in tea that's going to be next month. So we're going to have a session of the Dilma School of Tea's Brew Academy once a month. Um, it depends a lot on uh, where we are, um, what you tell us is your preferred time. So once a month, we are going next with luxury. We're going to continue with uh, uh, different aspects of manufacture, different aspects of gastronomy. We'll talk about mixology this year. We'll talk about the health benefits. We'll talk about the latest developments in health benefits. We'll talk about tea and music. There's a lot more to come. And so what, uh, based on the last time we were online, we've put together the bundles that you requested. Thank you for asking us. So everything we've presented is available at a special part and a special page on our School of Tea. So we've got a white tea bundle, green, and so on and so forth. So if you want that, there's a QR code on screen. Check it out or visit shop.dilmati.com and uh, choose what you would like. We talked about kindness. And what really makes a tea great is kindness to people and nature. And to thank you and to reassure you that what we do in honoring my father's philosophy of serving humanity is something real, it's tangible, and it is impactful. A quick look at what we do through the MJ Foundation and what we do through Dilma Conservation. Guys, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. If you have any more questions, please post them online at uh, the Dilma Tea Club or the Dilma Tea, Cl Tea Club for Professionals, our School of Tea, or email us. We'd love to talk more. But thank you, and I'll see you next month. Stay tea inspired. <laughs>